Now on to our presentation. Post-emergent foliar nutrient strategies to maximize cotton yield. Discussing today's topic will be Brian Hashemeyer, who's Director of Discovery and Innovation, and Gregory Jackson, Regional Agronomist, both from Brandt. To learn more about our speakers, you can click on the speaker bios widget at the bottom of the screen. Right now, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian. Brian, the floor is yours. Thanks, Willie. Before we tackle some of the foliar opportunities, I'd like to talk a little bit about one uh, pretty good opportunity at plant. Uh, we got a pretty good uh, program for you today. I think you guys will enjoy it a lot. So a new technology brand has been working on a lot is enzyme technology. Uh, and enzymes are really interesting uh, molecules. So what is an enzyme? It's a protein that will either break apart a substance or put a substance back together. And they're pivotal for life. There's a lot of enzymes found in soils, but we're gonna focus on three enzymes and how they might help you guys grow cotton. So enzymes, uh, main function or main place that they're located at is in the soil. And in order to have a good healthy soil, you need good enzyme activity. And most of the enzymes in the soil are put there either by the plants that exude them out of their roots or by microbes that exude them. And they do that to break down substances to get energy and the food sources. So enzymes are also very important for um, soil health and the USDA recognizes enzymes as an important factor of soil health. So the three enzymes that Brandt's been focusing on is phosphatase, mannanase, and lipase. And I'll go through and kind of explain these pretty simply to you guys. So mannanase enzyme uh, focuses on breaking down cellulose at the sugar level. And it's called mannanase enzyme because it focuses on the mannose sugar linkage. And if we look at organic matter in the soil, you have cellulose, hemocellulose, and lignin. Both the cellulose and the hemocellulose are polymers of sugar. So mannanase can take these polymers and break them down into individual sugar units that both plants and microbes can use to help grow and promote their health. Lipase breaks down lipids. Lipids make up 20% of organic matter in the soil. Um, they cause water issues, water flow issues, and they tend to have a lot of phosphate bound to them. And lipase breaks down those lipids. The third enzyme is phosphatase, and a lot like the name sounds like, it helps release organic phosphate. It cleaves the organic phosphate, breaks it apart, and releases inorganic phosphate. So here are some key products that I think you guys should consider. Ends up PDS, ends up KDS, ends up uh, manganese, and ends up zinc. These products at plant in the soil can help boost your cotton out of the ground, and they're very, very effective at doing that. Here's some yield results that we have versus ends up PDS versus uh, 1034O. In this trial, or these average of trials, we tested four pounds of ends up PDS versus eight gallons of 1034O. Uh, and you can see by the years, the average win rates, 67%, 72%, 85%, 65%. So on average, it's about a 70% win rate with these products. And you can see the yield increase increases anywhere from 90 to 100 pounds of cotton per acre. If we compare that versus 1034O of uh, eight gallons, you can see that the results are more consistent um, and slightly better yields. One thing that's really nice about ends up PDS is you can use a lower uh, rate. It has a lower salt index and it's a lot safer for cotton. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg Jackson and Greg's gonna talk about some of the foliar opportunities from a nutritional perspective. As Brian discussed, uh enzyme technology and planning and using the ends up products at first we're going to take it a little step further and go into after the plants emerge uh, one of the main issues you run into is is thrips that comes up in the first 10 to or so days of the cotton plant's life and one product that brent has to fit in this category is a product called silite 610 which is a diatomaceous earth insecticide um, this insecticide is an epa registered um, insecticide that it has it's a mechanical control insecticide so it is beneficial to helping control thrips which are very detrimental to cotton in the early stages and can affect yield in later on in in the production cycle as you'll see this diatomaceous earth in the best um, um, 
way for using it with the cotton is used as a center, just added to whatever the conventional sprays are or whatever the seed treatments are. In this study right here, it indicates where we were using uh, orthene, which is considered a standard, um, or acetate is the chemical name, in most of the cotton production areas, and they use a, usually a six ounce rate or an eight ounce rate. And in this study that was done here, the four days post treatment, six days post treatment, you'll see the thrips levels are improving when you add the cellite to the mix. The orthene by itself, and then look at the cellite with the orthene at a half rate. And this study was done by North Carolina State University and going forward from there. Um, when you apply the diatomaceous earth, it's mixed right in the tank. It's a powder type material, goes directly and easily in the solution. And this has been used very successfully in, in helping with thrips control. As, as I said, it's a mechanical control that gives a synergistic effect to the control of the thrips. Uh, usually at the second true leaf stage uh, is when this would be put out in from 10 to 22 days, depending upon the um, thrips populations that you have. And thrips being a sucking insect, when they crawl through or is exposed to the cellite, it uh, mechanically kills them, so there's no um, possibility for it to build up a resistance. So then when you've got acephate resistant um, in populations of thrips, then the cellite can be very beneficial to helping to control this. In this study here, the thrips on the average, you can see the cellite <clears throat> over here with the cellite plus the orthene had average controls better in, in two days post-treatment, four days post-treatment, and was equal or better even at um, on the average down here you have the better control. The North Carolina strip study, uh, the injury ratings, here again you can see a control versus the uh, orthene at six ounces, the cellite at six pounds, and then the cellite plus the orthene, um, you had better control across the board. It also lends itself to yield, as you see the greater yield, uh, slightly greater yield from the cellite plus the orthene. And when you use the cellite plus the orthene, there's a similar cost um, factor as far as just orthene by itself. Another study done in 2020 by Mississippi State um, Research Station uh, is a little bit different than the previous North Carolina study <clears throat> in that there was no pre-emergence insecticide or seed treatment. In the first study, there was a matacloprid put out there for all the um, at planting, so you had increased um, some activity from that. In this study, the cellite was used, um, as in all cases, with a non-ionic surfactant at 0.25%. And a gaucho seed treatment was the second treatment that was used in there. And then we had the gaucho plus the celli, but there was no orthene in this study. In this, um, as you can see, the adult thrips uh, were counted with taking five plants. And the way they check for thrips is they'll take the plants, put them in a solution, and then they strain the solution off and look at it under a microscope. So that's how you determine where their, um, their counts came from. As you have here, you have gaucho illustrated by the gray and the green being the gaucho seed treatment plus the six pounds of cellite and then red being the cellite by itself. When the study, you look out to the other side for the immature thrips, the adult thrips here versus the immature thrips, you had better control of the immature thrips as they're coming out, whereas the uh, gaucho plus the cellite had the better control showing the lower level of of thrips that were pleasant, present. This also transpired in the yield, in this case, um, 34 pounds, approximately 34 pounds of additional lint yield per acre, which then shows the influence that thrips when untreated, when the untreated check, and from the untreated check to the, that was over 300 pounds, um, approximately 300 pounds yield in um, difference. So you can see here where the product usage uh, definitely uh, lends itself to a good positive ROI. And now we're going to talk a little bit about strategies for manganese and zinc usage in cotton production. As this slide indicates, the um, parts of the cotton growing regions, which are primarily in the southeast, 
through the Carolinas, the Delta, Georgia, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, over into Texas are inherently loaded in iron, manganese, and zinc just by their the way their soils are formation and the type of soils that that is available. You can see by the dark bluish purple areas showing the largest area where zinc is is deficient, and you can see from the coloration of the map where it's uh, mostly very low, which indicates your additional addi- addition of additional uh, zinc would be beneficial. The same category map you overlay on each other almost identical where it comes to manganese and zinc in the areas of the country of which they are, which are sandy loam, um, low organic matter type soils. Manganese is extremely important to plant health. Uh, That's why we concentrate so much when it comes to foliar application on these at various stages of growth. Uh, because manganese is, is critical for um, photosynthesis, carbohydrate production, and in the general, just plant health. Um, at the first glare, squares to the bloom area, that's the USDA standard uh, tissue uh, sample levels range from 50 to 350. And if you have a man, and the 50 is extremely deficient. And the manganese deficiency usually shows up as yellow in between the leaf veins and at the top of the plant. Uh, another factor in the, uh, affecting manganese levels is the deficiency of their prevalent in soils with a pH of 6.3 or higher. So when you have the higher pH, you tend to have a lower availability of the mang- manganese in the soil. As for zinc, you know, they're in the same general areas. It is important for uh, improved growth and development, bowl set, maturity, and young and fiber and yield at the stages. When you look at the um, parts per million of zinc, it's 40 to 200, 40 again being extremely deficient in there, which is what you have to monitor in the tissue samples. It appears in the younger leaves in the upper canopy and in cans called shortening of the internodes and, and stunning of leaves and interbiome uh, chlorosis or yellowing. The factors reducing it also are high pH soils, um, Soils with high available phosphate levels, which is especially prominent in the southeast due to the cropping systems and fertilization that's gone on for, for years in the southeast. We tend to have extremely high phosphate levels. Cold, wet conditions and, um, and soils that are, that are high in organic matter there. The zinc um, is, when you're thinking about timing for the zinc, um, the first time you want to see about application is is in that early vegetative growth up the pinhead max edge square. Um, many herbicides that have uh, have compatibility problems with those micronutrients because they're usually going out with a herbicide and potentially an insecticide at that time. But a lot of the herbicides you have to be careful of which what type of chemistry you use to be. Um, so that they are uh, compatible and don't interfere with the activity of the chemical or can cause tank issues during spraying. So the key time there on the first application is in the, during the vegetative and the pinhead square growth when reproduction is just first starting. The second application from match head square to bloom and bowl set for foliar manganese and zinc. Uh, most micronutrients are typically mixed well with fungicides and insecticides that are used in cotton. But whereas in the herbicide level, you need to be extremely um, particular with, with what chemistries you use. Between the foliar and zinc uh, applications is recommended at least uh, 10 to 14 days apart to be sure for actual active, um, more, more beneficial uh, application of those products during those stages. Um, in this category, there's several products that, that I mentioned that you needed to be careful of what you mix in chemistries in those times when you apply. Uh, Brandt Smart Trio, which has been a long time workhorse for us, it's done extremely well, it has stress mitigation properties in it, as you can see from the analysis, is high on the sulfur, zinc, and manganese side. Uh, but a key thing here to mention is that it does not mix with all herbicides especially the TRIO does not mix with the dicamba and the 2,4-D new chemistries for cotton that's, that's on the market today. However, it's extremely proficient and, 
and very widely used with with Roundup and and Liberty with herbicides, and is compatible with fungicides and insecticides. Then you have Brant Smart Manganese, which is a sister product to the Trio. If you just need to boost the manganese, sometimes your zinc levels may be a level where you could use the Trio, you could use some Smart Manganese to go with it, but it falls into the same category as not as as um, versatile when using it with most of the herbicides, with the exception of your Roundup or Liberty. So if you're using a production program that encompasses Roundup and Liberty as your primary herbicides, then Trio and Smart Manganese would be good choices for yourself. Here again, it's compatible with the insecticides. When you get into the new chemistries, our DNI division has developed about three new products over the last few years that have become very widely expressed. They're all labeled and approved on the DICAM, the 2,4-D um, type chemistries that are being widely used, especially in the Delta, and is widening in some areas with that product. Those products are designed for being able to mix with very efficiently uh, and are very compatible with those new herbicides. It would be the Smart Manganese Plus, Smart Sulfur Plus, and Smart Quattro Plus. Um, here again, you've got herbicide activity that's, I mean, compatibility. You've got with glyphosate and Liberty, and you've got insecticides and fungicides. The, the thing I would add here about the Sulfur Plus is gaining a lot of traction, uh, even especially in the Delta, because we don't have as much free sulfur from the atmosphere as we used to get. So sulfur is becoming more and more of an issue that needs to be uh, addressed uh, in cotton and other crops as well. So these are these are five, six, five products that, that Brent has that fits into this category from the manganese and zinc solutions and sulfur that can be extremely important to a cotton, successful co cotton crop. Um, these are tissue uh, tests samples that was taken out of Georgia from some treatments that were done uh, showing where the, ap the application of smart manganese, where you've got the untreated check versus that. You can see where the tissue samples are picked up almost immediately in the soil and the tissue sample test after application. So if uh, the foliar zinc and manganese applications will elevate petiole levels as well as in the tissue within the plant. And here again, make these applications 10 to 14 days apart with the key times being, at, you know, the early stages with the herbicide and then, you know, 10 to 14 to 20 some days later after that. Zinc studies and manganese parts per million and two other studies where it was in, in Tennessee and Georgia, multiple trials here again. Um, and these they elevate the petiole levels for approximately 7 to 14 days. Therefore, again, putting on the second um treatment uh, coming in uh, 14 days apart when you between the manganese and the zinc or either one of the two if you're coming up short. So as it says, the tissue test showed that this trio increased the zinc part by 98% and the manganese by 122% within one day of treatment. And it's extremely important when they're pulling tissue samples that you pull those tissue samples and you have them uh, correctly washed before you submit them because you want to know what gets into the plant. So some chemistries are able to get into the plant where it, as is the trio, the smart manganese and the and the smart plus, the manganese plus and, and the quattro products all get into the plant very efficiently. Whereas some chemistries um, do not. So it's very important on what chemistries you choose when you're using these foliar materials in cotton especially. Um, this was studies um, throughout the southeast. Uh, that includes Trio, Smart Manganese, Quattro Plus, and Smart Manganese Plus. And this is acres and trial in here. The, all these are, are very positive trials and, and win rates. It has been tested in all of these areas of production throughout where cotton is raised. Of these studies taken, the average yield increase of all the brand, these brand products put in there, it was an overall um, uh, 104, point, 104 pounds per acre with a 68% win rate. And that is a pretty high compared in the nutrient studies that I've looked at through the years, a very high positive uh, win rate here for these, these successful products. Now we'll move in and talk about foliar boron strategies on our cotton. Boron, from my personal opinion, 
uh, people that I've worked with in the past I always call more on the general. It kind of tells everybody else what to do when it comes to nutrition within the plant. So it's a very critical part of, of boron strategies. And the, the reason is, especially in the southeast, as we talked about the levels of the soil, we're talking about sandy loams that are high texture, coarse type soils. Most of them have low cation exchange capacity, low organic matters, and all these things affect um, the thing with common in peanut growing regions, just like it is in, in cotton growing regions. The uh, soil texture, non-sandy soil, boron tends to hold boron a little better than a sandy soil. Uh, it tends to leach out. Rainfall is a, is a major player in these sandy soils as the high rainfall levels tends to wash the boron out and get it out of the root zone. Historically, I've always used, and from what I've said, if you get two to four inches of rainfall in a, in a sandy loam or eastern coast, east coast sandy loam, you've washed the, the boron pretty much out of the root zone from a, from an effective standpoint. Organic matter, high organic matter will hold on to more boron than it will and keep it available in the root zone where the plant can utilize it. And then on pH, um, the borons are more available or can be in the area with, um, uh, with boron and iron. And the five to 6.5 pHs, it tends to, to move on out. One thing here that I always tell growers when it comes to boron, I get asked the question a lot of time in the field, when you're talking about boron, what should I do? And the recommendations from a lot of the universities for many years was, you know, how much boron do you put on a plant? And the old researchers that I had talked in previous years and several years ago said, well, how much, how did you determine you need to put a half a pound of actual boron on from say soluble or some granular type product? And from a foliar standpoint, if you're using foliar soluble, for example, uh, and you put on a half a pound, that's about a two and a half pound rate that um, that's the maximum amount you can put on the plant without causing phytotoxicity is what a lot of them told me. So when they ask me, what do I do? Do I put it on the ground or put it on foliar? And you need a combination of both. If you remembering what I said, when you, when you have boron in the ground, if you put out some of it on the ground in a granular fertilizer, after two inches of rain, it's out of the root zone from availability. So a foliar application from boron is extremely critical and you want to put on three to four applications that we'll kind of discuss um, moving in here now. Why is boron so critical? It's important for pollination, for increased fruit set, improves calcium utilization, quality and yield. Um, this is a, uh, from 25 to 65 parts per million that you you see in tissues with 25 being extremely low. Um, the low boron levels, this is a microscopic showing of some concentric rings that show up here that indicates um, what some gaps you can get, I guess, in the growth with the, um, with the boron. Flower abortion and bowl shedding may occur in some conditions contributing to excessive stalk growth, or you can actually get some rat tailing, what we call rat, I call rat tailing off of the, the points on the cotton plant. So boron historically has not been very, um, mobile within the plant, but uh, we've come up with some chemistries that, that does help that, and that'll be discussed here in, in just a few minutes. So boron is critical at the early stages of growth. Um, usually what I say at pinhead, match head square, is when you first put it on because the, the bowl, the physiology of the, the cotton bowl, the cotton plant starts putting on squares, which are the precursor to what will become the bloom, which will later on become the bowls. Um, and you want to have as many, um, you want to set a lot of bowl, a lot of squares, and then so you would potentially to have the bowl. So the boron helps to in square retention. I've done some studies in my earlier career um, where we put on boron, and you could walk through the field and see where the boron did not move. You could see much more square drop in some areas than you'd see in others. So our products on the market are very beneficial and very uh, efficient at supplying boron to the growing point to help retain those squares. So pinhead match head square, um, and then 15 to 20% bloom, and then 10 to 15 days later, getting closer to the bowl field. I also recommend a fourth application uh, later on as these bowls are maturing, 
um, and the seed inside that bowl is developing. Boron is extremely critical, as is zinc and some others, but boron especially for seed development. And in the cotton plant, if seed develops inside that bowl and it reaches maturation, the seed develops that mature that will mature the lint. The lint will mature. If the lint matures, the bowl will open. If it's stressed or there's low boron, you can get what's called hard lock cotton. And that's due to the, the, one of the factors, one factor that can affect that is low boron. So later season, especially on the season where you've had lots of rain, the late season application of boron, um, during bowl fill is beneficial for that fourth application. The products in here that have been developed, as I mentioned, um, our, our old chemistry was, um, in boron, we've moved into some newer, better chemistries now that are more efficient within the plant that Brian's going to discuss a little bit later. Um, but Smart BMO and Smart B, uh, the Smart BMO is used probably more in in peanuts and cotton. I mean, peanuts and soybeans than it is in cotton, but it also works in there as well, and you'll get benefit from the BMO. Uh, Smart B, which is a 5% um Boron very efficient about getting into the plant and mitigating to the growth points. A smart KB, which is a dual purpose one that we'll talk about next, is it's got a, a high level of potash in it and boron and molybdenum. And then 10% boron, which is very prominent, especially down in the, in all parts of the cotton production system. But the use of these lower uh, percentage borons, because they're more efficient than a 10% can be, makes it a very positive um, um, effect for them. Another thing about the three borons listed up here between the B and the BMO and the KB is they're very compatible with manganese sprays as well during those early stages when you're putting on boron along with the um, zinc manganese products. So Brant KB has been especially good on cotton. It's one that I highly recommend in these, these um, production times. Um, Key, way, key takeaways here, uh, all boron products perform well, whether it's liquid 10%, smart BMO, KB, or solubor, but the smart boron technology has a higher win rate, as you can see indicated here by the yields. Um, the yields in this graph, higher win rate and a higher average yield increase with the pounds of cotton and the win rate. So this is the win rate where you've got an increase of 92 pounds, 126, 142, and 84 depending on the trial, based because whether it's soluble or KB. KB, here again, is really performing well and is gaining a lot of, of uh, traction in the cotton production areas. This was over 2017 to 2020 with 42 different cotton trials. With that, I think I'm going to turn it back to Brian and tell you a little bit more on the technical side of why the borons are there. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so you might ask yourself, why is the smart technology outperforming the conventional products like 10% boron <clears throat> and soluble? Uh, a lot of it has to do with the mobility of boron in the plant. It's not very mobile. And if you look at that picture on the top right-hand side there, you're going to see boron, what I call a cross-link to the cell wall structure. You can see it has that cross shape with the boron in the middle. So boron is really important for cell wall structure um, as well as calcium. And that's why those two uh, nutrients are considered not very mobile because once they're associated in the cell wall structure, the plant cannot remobilize that boron very efficiently. So one of the challenges is when you make a foliar boron uh, application is once it gets through the cuticle, it tends to bind to the cell walls rather quickly. And that makes it difficult for it to translocate to the new growing points or to the developing flowers or bowls where you really need it. If you look at the picture on the bottom right-hand side, uh, there's two boron sources there, one boric acid and the other one, the smart B. And if you look at the smart B, you can see that that boron is already cross-linked. Because it's already cross-linked, it doesn't get caught up in the cell wall structures and it can translocate directly to the developing flowers and the bowls. And that's the reason we're seeing the higher win rates and the higher yields. Now, having said that, all boron products we feel are pretty effective, uh, but there is a bit of advantage from having the smart technology, not only in the tank mixability and compatibility, but in terms of translocation through the plant, 
and that's why we're seeing higher win rates <clears throat> and better yields. We go to the next slide. So this is some interesting uh, boron where we looked at tissue test levels versus responsiveness. And this data isn't all that surprising. If you look at when you have tissue test levels below 25 parts per million, uh, the average yield increase was 173 pounds per acre and the win rate was 87%. So not too surprising that when you have a deficient situation, you have a very responsive crop. And if we look at that graph as the yield numbers get higher, or the tissue test numbers get higher, uh, the win rates are still decent, but they go down a little bit. Um, not too surprising if you have good uh, boron tissue levels um, that your win rates won't be as high. So something to keep in mind with micronutrients is understanding placement and timing and making the applications and taking tissue tests. But on the last two bars there where it says high yield and low yield, this is a trend we've been seeing as guys push yield. When you've set higher yields and you set more bowls, you're trying to set more flowers. So if we took all our yield data and we took the top half of yielding crop versus the lower half, we had higher win rates on the higher yielding. And the reason why is you're setting more bowls uh, and you have higher boron demand. And so our yield response isn't always tissue related. You also have to consider what is the yield potential of this field? How aggressively am I managing it? And do I have the base NPK to push it to where it needs to be? So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Greg. And uh, back to him, he's going to talk a little bit about foliar potassium. As, and thank you, Brian, as in the, um, with the supplemental potassium, as, as cotton production has evolved over the last half a century or so, especially um, 40 or 50 years, the, um, we've all gotten these higher yield, everybody's looking for higher yield and, and increases in, in cotton lint production per acre. So supplemental potassium is extremely critical there because it's kind of like everything we've talked about so far. We've gotten the plant out of the ground. We've protected it from thrips. We've uh, fed it the, the zinc and the manganese that it needs, and we've fed the boron to do what? Set more bowls. So we're trying to set those bowls. And it's like my granddaddy always used to say, when you when you uh, you feed, you got a bunch of horses out there, you got to give them more feed to get them to grow. And that's the story here, basically. You got to get the the bowls to grow and and to 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 uh, mature, and that's where potassium comes in. The high demand for potassium in cotton is is well established and has been for years. Um, in high yielding cotton varieties, there's as much as three fourths of the potassium that's partitioned to the fruiting structures, which is the bowl. Bowls are um, the potassium is also very key in fiber quality and strength, and that's the, what you're actually paid on, not only lint but in the, the grays that you get out of the cotton. So if you look at the um, the chart on the right, talking about nutrient uptake and, and days after planting, you look in there when the, that across the bottom, you look at, you know, first bloom, you start picking up peak bloom. And this, when these bowls are, are setting up and maturing, it's an extremely critical time of the year that additional potash is available. And it could not be available in the soil or have already potentially leached out, et cetera. So when you look at cotton potassium deficiency, um, potassium deficiency occurs appears initially as intravenal chlorosis in there. Uh, after peak bloom, similar deficiency symptoms are going to appear um, on the new growth. If deficiency symptoms become severe enough, they can cause you little, you know, little necrotic areas to form down here. But this chlorosis is normally what you would potentially see. Another indication that is being linked uh, very um, directly almost to potassium deficiencies is a condition or a disease called stemphilian leaf spot. It correlates to potassium deficiencies, probably because the, in these deficiencies um, situations, the plant's more susceptible or, or they're just very, very linked together. Foliar fungicides that they've applied have do not appear to be very effective, effective with this stemphilium unless the potassium deficiency is addressed. So if you increase the potassium deficiency with a foliar potassium, you can go from there. Because at the time of the year you're talking about, the reason I said foliar potassium, it's extremely hard to get a granular in any form in a cotton plant that's, you know, say four feet tall and overlapping in the middle. So getting through there and putting on something on the ground is is, is hard, or you can put it on uh, foliarly. 
Under lemon and soil conditions, foliar applications of potassium during bowl fill can supplement that potassium demand and reduce this condition of stem filial leaf spot. Um, proven and tested brand products here again has been developed uh, over the last few years. DNI uh, Smart KB, as you heard me mention before, Manaplex K, which is uh, another product, 20% K2O, and that's in our Manaplex chemistry with the Manitol um, delivery system. And then the Enza KDS, which is an enzyme type product that, you know, similar to what, what Brian talked about, said this is the KDS, which is 5% nitrogen, 49% potash, and 8% sulfur. A lot of your cotton production programs um, recommend uh, later season um, some of your fertilizer materials. They'll take meltdown potassium nitrate, for example, KNO3, and apply it because you're getting some higher, they want some higher nitrogen, or if you've had a lot of leaching, you need some more nitrogen. The KDS would be a, a product that could be conditioned in here for, for side dressing. Um, but the key one that I want to key in on is the Brant Smart KB, which is 2% nitrogen, 16% potassium, 2.5% boron, and 0.2 of molly, and with excellent compatibility with insecticides and fungicides. So this is something you can put on, get a, a strong shot of potash foliarly that this plant can take up and easily use. You're also getting boron. So when I was talking about the boron applications, if you use the KB as your source later on, you're getting the same thing out of a quart of KB that you're the same activity that you're going to get out of a, our recommended rate of a pint of the Smart B, and you're getting the, the potassium in there basically as a, as a freebie. So Sprint Smart KB is one that I would strongly recommend at that, that part in the season, especially on cotton. Brian? Thanks, Greg. A lot of really good information there. I'm going to take a little time and just review some of the stuff that Greg and myself have gone over real quickly. So if we look at this from planting all the way to harvest and go through and look at the opportunities, the enzymes are great for at plant. They really increase the soil activity and give your cotton crop a boost. We see a lot of early plant vigor with the enzyme technology. From an insect control, cell light 610, a diatomaceous earth, it can deter feeding and protect that cotton in that early sensitive stage. Um, if you're looking at resistance issues or trying to boost your orthene, uh, cell light 610 I think is a great opportunity to look at. Zinc and manganese, really important on cotton. Um, we have some great foliar opportunities with that. With the soil types that you have in the cotton growing areas, it makes a lot of sense to, to boost those manganese numbers or zinc levels in the crop. The Brant Smart System is great for that. A lot of these products are designed to be mixed with herbicides and fungicides and make your guys' life easier. There's some pretty challenging herbicides to mix with, and if you use the Manganese Plus and the Quattro Plus and Sulfur Plus, it mixes all day long and uh, makes it really easy for the growers. Now, if we move into the reproductive and start looking at match S squared and blue, we know that boron and potassium are really important, as Greg just highlighted. The highlight product there is Brant Smart KB. If you look at peak timing for boron and K, they tend to overlap each other. So making that K application with the boron, you can see pretty positive uh, effects with that. So uh, boron is always a great opportunity, but if you're really looking to the K with the B, Brant Smart KB is a great opportunity. Now let's talk about some of the, the Brandt people, Team Brandt, as I'd like to call it. As you just had the chance to listen to Greg Jackson, Greg is our senior technical agronomist in the southeast and the Delta. He is an absolutely wonderful resource for Team Brandt and for our growers. Um, but we also have a pretty good team down there as well with Charles Lanfear, Jeremy Roundtree, Clay Atkins, uh, Laura Beth, Lee Walker, Jason Weddington. That's one of the really nice things that I really enjoy about Brandt is the people we have, and they are the most valuable resource that we do have. And we really hope that you guys will utilize their expertise. So um, never hesitate to reach out to one of the Brandt team members. So you might ask, where do you find labels and SDSs and information about Brandt? One of the easiest ways to do that is actually through our Brandt Product Finder app. If you go to and search Brandt Product Finder app, either on ISO or Android, you'll be able to download this app and search for products, get the labels, get the SDSs. 
um, as well as find contact information for key grant personnel. With that, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time uh, to listen to us today. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to Team Grant. Thank you. Well, thanks to Brian and Greg for this great session. And now we're going to turn over to the question and answer portion of this session. Brian, I'm going to start with you. Um, what are the proper mixing steps for the enzyme fertilizers in furrow? Yeah, good question. Um, enzymes can be mixed with pretty much any starter fertilizer pretty easy. If you look at enzyme zinc and manganese as an additive to an existing starter fertilizer, um, enzymes are pretty robust. There's a lot of technology in these products to protect the enzymes. A couple watch outs, though. You don't want to mix them with things that are really acidic with pH below four that'll tear the enzyme apart or really high pH above nine. Um, and once you've mixed them, you want to use them within a week's period of time. Um, one question I get a lot is are enzymes, I think, but I think they're living organisms and they're not like microbes. Um, because they're non-living organisms, they're a bit more uh, stable than microbes, uh, but we still need to be careful with them. So I got another question for you, Brian, and, and I guess it's a, a kind of leads into your comment that these aren't microbes, but how long do enzymes last in the soil once you've applied them? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, they are protein-based organisms, so they will break down, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, patented technology going into these enzymes to protect them for longer periods of time. So once we put them in the soil, they're going to last um, somewhere between 60 to 90 days, depending on the, the soil environment. And that's enough to, to pop the cotton out of the ground, give early plant vigor that we'd like to see and get the cotton off to a good start. Well, it's always good to get cotton off to a good start. That's for sure. So I'm going to turn to Greg now uh, with this question. And I, I was curious about this. When do you recommend applying silate 610? Is it best by itself or is it mixed with other or mixed with other insecticides? I'll go ahead and answer that, Willie. The, Thank you, Brian. The, uh, it, it can go both ways. If you have resistant uh, thread populations, it really makes a lot of sense to think about mixing uh, the DE, the silate 610 with it. That can really help with that type of thing. But another thing that DE does is a little bit different is it really deters feeding. Um, so sometimes thrift populations may not go down, but even mixed with a traditional insecticide like acephate, if you notice in the trial data, we saw a yield boost from that. Um, so it can go either way. It can be a standalone if you have low pressure, um, but it's certainly, I think probably the best is conventional practices, mixing it with your current insecticide. Okay, sounds good. You know, I'm going to stick with you, Brian, but I want to go to the smart system for a little bit here. Um, and, and I guess the question I have is, can the smart system micronutrients be sprayed by aerial application or applied in pivot irrigation? I mean, we're trying to do new things here. Yeah, that's really one of the unique things about smart systems. A lot of times when you're taking something through a pivot, you got to put it in a mixing comb, and the micronutrients are notorious for not mixing very well when you start running through those type of systems. Um, the smart system technology that protects it from interacting with herbicides also makes it really easy to use uh, through pivots or in low volume aerial applications. So yeah, you can do it either way. It works great. Okay. That's, that's fascinating. Well then um, as we keep talking about micronutrients for a minute, and this is an interesting question because of some of the stuff going on um, when you look at using these and the timing in the season, is it safe to apply these micronutrients with herbicides? You know, sometimes herbicides will stress the plant. So will mixing a manganese or zinc micronutrient with that herbicide make it worse? Uh, that's a good question. It's a, it's a pretty common question. Uh, because some herbicides, you can see a little stress from it. And the association may be that adding more salt to it might burn it more. Um, when in fact, what we see more often than not is actually a safening effect. Uh, zinc and manganese are really important for plant health and actually upregulate some enzymes that help the plant metabolize herbicides and deal with stress. Um, so actually, typically, it's, it's the opposite of what we see when we see the safening effect from doing that. Oh, fascinating. I think we've got Greg back. So um, I'm going to ask you, Greg, if, can, I, can you hear us now? Okay. This is the beauty of live, folks. Stuff happens, and you just keep on moving. So, 
But Brian, I, I, I want to ask you another question about say like six ten since I've got you here, and um, will it wash off with rain or irrigation? I mean, it is a mechanical insecticide. Yeah, if, if you saw those pictures, you saw the white powder on top of the cotton leaves, and uh, particularly in the southeast with all the rainfall, and if you get it on pivots, it's a pretty fair question to ask. Um, the DE, the diatomaceous earth, does stick pretty well to the uh, leaves of the plant. Um, it can take quite a bit of rainfall. Um, we're really only looking for that early uh, stage there for that uh, DE to stay on. And uh, so, so far, all our trials in the southeast have had quite a bit of rain on top of them have performed quite well. Uh, there is some wash off, uh, but what we've seen is good results and not enough is washing off to cause a problem. So, yeah, we feel really comfortable with making those applications despite all, all the rain. So, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, you're really getting that thrip early. That's the timing on the mechanical, right? Yeah, I mean, this this product is designed to be early, be in that first one or two weeks when the cotton crop's really sensitive uh, to those pests. Um, it's not going to be continually applied throughout the season. Just because the cotton crop's growing so fast, you need coverage for the control. Okay. Well, let's, let's you know, boron's a big deal. Um, we talked about that in the presentation. Um, can you give me an idea of the um, the ideal time for boron application on cotton? Yeah, not a problem. Um, in fact, in most crops, it's usually during the reproductive period, and that's definitely the case with cotton. If you look at the reproductive organs in, in all crops, uh, the flowers and the pollen tubes, they're very rich in boron, so there's pretty heavy boron demand during and right before flowering and during the development of the bowl. So um, once you start... You're thinking about flowering, and uh, another way to think about that, it often lines up pretty well with the fungicide application timing. So once you start getting match head square and the flowers start developing, um, think about boron. Well, I think, yeah, that's a, probably a good idea. <laughs> Such a, like uh, Greg said in the presentation, it's sort of the, the magic uh, sauce for making things pull all pull things together, right? That's important. Um, another, I have a question about potassium and boron. Is it okay to apply potassium and boron at the same time? The timing seem to appear to overlap. Yeah, the, the timings do overlap. Uh, when you apply, a, if you look at the peak time for potassium, it overlaps the peak time for boron. And there's no way you could apply enough polar potassium to make up a cotton's uh, need. So what we're really looking for is during those times when you get peak uptake, you can have these transient nutrient deficiencies, which means there's so much demand in that short period of time, even with all that potassium in the soil, or if you have a drought or you've had a lot of irrigation or something like that, by making that supplemental K application at that time, you can get that plant through that stressful period. Um, and so K and boron's peak timings happen to be at the exact same time, so it makes a lot of sense to when you're going out there, you're already going across the field to think about doing that. And K can help a lot with stress too, right? And that's another reason flowers will abort. It's under stressful situations. So yeah, I mean, for me, it makes 100% sense to put boron with cast, uh, boron with potassium and, and apply it during flowering. Okay, really good. Well, we appreciate your time today. We've kind of worked our way through all the questions. Um, I'm sorry, Greg couldn't join us for all the answers, but Brian, you did a wonderful job of filling us in on some of the key details of all the brand products. So uh, that's pretty much, I think we're gonna wrap up now. I wanna thank you and appreciate your time and expertise for today's topic. I wanna thank our sponsor Brandt as well as everyone in the audience. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today.